Welcome to this session on strategic communications. I'm Hilde Saizo. I'm a subject matter expert with SPI, Strategies for Policing Innovation. Um, and I've been with uh, SPI since its very beginning in, uh, in 2009. Now, your first impression might be, why are we talking about strategic communications at an SPI meeting? Well, what we have learned over the last decade in SPI is just how important communications is. In other words, how you build support for the SPI within your agency and with the community you serve can really have an impact on your success and certainly on the ability to sustain any successes and have that long-term impact that you want. Now, we are fortunate to have a communications and community engagement expert with us today, Laura McElroy, to guide us on this important topic of strategic communications. Now, if I can't convince you of its importance, I know Laura will. Laura was a reporter and law enforcement agency communications director for 26 years. She served as public information officer for the Tampa Police Department and is now a member of the Chicago Police Department independent monitoring team focusing specifically on community engagement. In her work with CNA, she engages with police agencies all around the nation, sharing best practices in crisis communications, media relations, social media, and of course, community outreach. So let me turn this over to Laura. We'll take questions at the end, but also remember to put your questions into the chat function. Laura? Thanks so much, Hilde. I appreciate all those kind, embarrassing words. <laughs> uh, now, some people might think that uh, massive nationwide anti-police protests and a worldwide pandemic that has forced you to change the way you police could dampen your community engagement. But nobody likes a negative Nelly. So what we'll do today is try to focus on how do you overcome those obstacles and looking at examples of other agencies that have faced the, the same obstacles that you have and have come up with ways to engage the community. Because the bottom line is that you need the community uh, to do your job and you need support, especially as you're getting ready to launch your SPI initiative um, for both your internal audience and the external audience. Um, so we'll look at, at some examples of, of how to get it done and how to bring, as, as I like to say, your own weather to your picnic because the bottom line is you need that community engagement, whether there's a pandemic going on or not, you still have to accomplish it. So let's, we'll look at some examples today. So before we, we get into the weeds on community engagement, I'd like to start on a, the philosophical level, the concept level, and that is by asking you the question of what does communication mean to you? Is it a technique? Is it what words should I choose? What's the best way for me to get my message across? What, what medium can I use? Or is it a value? Is it a guiding principle of how you do business as an individual and as an organization? Because how you answer that question can have a very profound impact on your community during a crisis, but also during the good times for your organization and for your community. The, the first chief that I ever worked for used to say that one of the greatest assets of any law enforcement agency is an informed and engaged community. Because if they understand what you're doing and they see value in what you're doing and they appreciate it, then they're much more likely to be part of the solution, to get engaged, to support the police department, to work as a team to move toward the goal of making a better community. And ultimately that creates a safer environment for your officers if they have the support of the community. The bottom line is it's all about building that mutual trust. And when I worked for the Tampa Police Department, we pretty much worked from a defensive position. And that was that every single day with whatever we were doing, whether we were working with the local media, the uh, social media, with an e-newsletter, with community groups, and every single day we operated from the defensive position that we must show our community that we are worthy of the power bestowed upon us. 
the power to take away somebody's freedom and the power to use deadly force if necessary. And we, we were always trying to earn more points with the community in this area. I called it a hundred warm and fuzzies before the next uh-oh. And the second chief I ever worked for also had a saying and hers was that it took a hundred attaboys before the next oh shit. And as you all know, it's just a matter of time until the next critical incident happens in the industry you've chosen, law enforcement. We use what I call the 360 approach to communication. And that means no matter how you're communicating, no matter what your involvement is, whether it's officers out on patrol engaging with the community or a clerk, um, a records clerk engaging with the community or a dispatcher, if you're getting ready to launch a new program, a new initiative, a new SPI initiative, if you're getting ready to launch a new operation or some new training or introduce a new technology, a new tool, that no matter what it is, that you're always asking yourself the same set of questions and doing it at the top of the organization down, which is how do we tell the community about this? How do we make sure that that we are listening to them and we're getting their feedback on this. And when you think about a new policy, when you think about a new operation, you might not think, well, why should the community weigh in on it? Why should they have a voice? But I'm gonna show you examples today of how it has been effective for other organizations to bring the community in on the front end as you're developing the policy, as you're developing the program and asking yourself these questions of how do we let the community know that we care about what they have to say, that we're listening to them and we value their input so that you can build trust with the community through every step and every interaction that you have. So we all know that during COVID, it's more challenging than ever. So let's look at some examples. And I'm starting with Mountain View Police Department out of California. And they started what they call their Partnership for the Future of Policing. And they did it with a very small group with 10 participants and they called it the cohort. And it, they held 10 sessions. Eight of those were on Zoom and two were in person like a Citizens Academy where people get a sneak peek behind the scenes um, of the police department to build some empathy and some understanding of what a police officer faces in order to do their job. And then from this feedback over their 10 sessions and 36 hours of conversation, they are updating what they have just launched, what they call their race and equity inclusion action plan. And so they have established this plan and they are including the community feedback in it to make sure that the plan is reflective of the community values and what their community sees as important. Um, and they're in the process right now of recruiting for their second cohort. In Tampa, we did something similar. Um, right after the tragic death of George Floyd, Tampa saw some of the most violent protests that they have experienced in recent history. I was with Tampa during the Republican National Convention, during the Super Bowl, during major manhunts for an uh, individual who took the life of two police officers during Occupy Tampa, during some very controversial times. And we never experienced the type of protest that turned to violence and looting like we did after the death of George Floyd. And so um, I went to work for the mayor, who is the former police chief, uh, right after the police department arrested 68 protesters. It was on day eight of protesting. And we created what we call the Mayor's Community Task Force on Policing. And we brought in 30 community members, approximately 30, 40 community members, and then 10 police officers. And we used questions to guide the conversation. As we all know, when you try to sit down with the community on the heels of something controversial, it can turn into such an emotional experience that it's hard to get any tangible, useful information from the community. And so we used, we let them vent and then we used questions to guide the conversation so that we could get tangible, usable information and then convert that into recommendations that the community could see their voice actively driving the recommendations and the changes to the police department. But they didn't do it alone. They did it with police officers in the room with a joint discussion. So it was truly building that team approach to improving the organization. 
in Brooklyn Park, they used a much broader approach. They opened up their listening sessions to the entire community rather than using a targeted targeted group of leaders or influencers. Let's just play this short video of them um, letting the community know about their listening sessions. We want to hear from you about police reform and racial justice. Hi, I'm Asia King, the chair of the city's Human Rights Commission. And I'm Mayor Jeff Lundy. After the tragic killing of George Floyd by the Minneapolis Police Department at the end of May, our city has been grieving the loss and looking for ways to ensure our community continues to be protected and safe. We have been listening and the Human Rights Commission, along with city council members, want to know what more can we do. We want to hear from you. So this was a much broader approach um, of inviting the entire community, anyone who wanted to participate. We saw the same thing in Golden, Colorado. Here's a flyer from social media where they're letting the community know that they can have a voice in the process and join in their listening sessions. In Santa Monica, we saw something similar, but instead of coming before the police chief and the city manager or the mayor, that people would be sharing their experiences before um, a reform committee that would be coming up with recommendations for the police department. In larger cities, we saw communities doing it by neighborhood. Here's an example from Southern Queens where it was a combination of an in-person meeting as well as a virtual meeting. And I added this, this example from Boston because I loved what they did here. They did their three months of listening sessions. They did their research and deliberation and then came up with their recommendations and took those recommendations back to the community. So the community had another, another opportunity to weigh in specifically on the recommendations. Are these recommendations that reflect what the community wants? Is this truly going to be a police department of the people. And so it was an, another layer of input from the community. In Salt Lake City, the, they were worked with a much smaller group, but I, I included this one because of the news coverage that it generated some really positive um, feedback for the police department. It's a scary thing for agencies to open up and to let the community vent and let the community share their perspective in such a public way, but there is um, positive outcomes that come from it, that, that it becomes more of that team approach. And here's an example um, of, of a step in the right direction in Salt Lake. The openness, my goodness, how open and transparent it was. And that's why we need to be a model for, for the rest of the nation. It's unbelievable. Um, I lived in, this is the fourth state I lived in. I've never seen anything like this. I have never seen anything like this. And it is amazing. The reward for being open, the reward for bringing the community in. Is it perfect? No. Is it going to diffuse or deescalate all of your critics? No. But it is a step in the right direction. It is a step toward building a cohesive team approach to um, ensuring that the police department reflects the values of your community. In Champaign, Illinois, uh, they also held a series of listening sessions and they had done this back in 2015 and from it created their strategic plan. So this community has a history of using this exact same approach to make sure that the community has a voice in the process um, of, of how they police. In Milwaukee, they just launched their first e-newsletter. If you've ever considered doing something like this, the time is now. We have all become so much more reliant on the screen in front of us. And so in some ways you have a bit of a captive audience because people are online all day long for their work, more so than ever before. You're out there doing good things. In Milwaukee, we see them sharing it uh, online through this new digital uh, e-newsletter. In Tacoma Park, they are just finished recruiting for their first virtual Citizens Academy. It's going to be 14 weeks of uh, Zoom meetings. In Orlando, they also uh, held their Zoom, their Citizens Academy online, and it was so successful that they're in the process right now of recruiting for a Hispanic uh, Citizens Academy. And a lot of the typical demos that you would see with a Citizens Academy were recorded. The K-9 demo, the mounted patrol, uh, the tour of the station was all videotaped and shared uh, online. 
And I want to show this other example with you um, in Orlando because it's something that can be so easily converted and used by any community. This is something that worked for the community. It was driven by the faith-based community and Orlando PD said, oh, we want to piggyback on that. We want to be part of this positive energy. And so they created their own virtual choir. Am I advocating that you sing on TV? Not necessarily, but if you are watching and you have your PIO office watching what's working in your community, what are people getting excited about? What are they sharing and getting involved with in social media? And then take that lesson and convert it to something that works for the police department, that you can be part of whatever is working for your community. Um, and, and so I'll just show you this quick snippet from the Orlando uh, PD virtual choir. I don't know about you, but I got goosebumps when I watched this. And I know with SPI and back at home, you're counting the dots on the map. But in the PIO office, counting goosebumps is a barometer as well. That tells me that the Orlando Police Department reached its community, that it touched its community, that it connected with its community. And what does that do but build build that team that the community feels part of something with the police department. And again, I'm not saying that you, you know, need to put together a fancy video like this and, and sing on, on camera. But if you're just paying attention to what's working in your community and what your community is responsive to, then you can piggyback off of that, leverage that so that your agency is involved in that positive energy. We all know that there is uh, a ton of um, criticism and scrutiny on law enforcement right now. So anything that you can do that shows that the, the, your police department is out there doing good things for the community and highlighting that is a positive for your organization. Okay, so let's get back to some more serious um, examples. I want to share this one with you out of Sacramento. This is um, uh, the chief's interview um, right after a controversial officer involved shooting. Um, it was two white officers who shot and killed an unarmed uh, black teenager. He was holding a cell phone. They thought it was a gun. Immediately after the shooting, there were protests uh, in the community. The protests started to quiet down and then the chief moved very quickly to release the body worn camera video. Immediately after that, the protest started up again. Uh, there was an issue with audio that they had not resolved with their policy prior to um, starting their body worn camera program. I want to show you this clip. This is the morning after the chief released uh, the video. And I, I'd ask you to think about what it, what is the takeaway for the community and what is the message to the community that this chief is not doing a news conference where everybody is in the room. He's making the rounds, which works in the COVID world. He's He went to the TV stations the night before for the 10 o'clock news and now he's making the rounds the morning after. What does that say to the members of the media and what does that say to the community that this chief is willing to put himself out there on pretty much a worst case scenario, you have white officers shooting and killing an unarmed teen. Um, so let's listen to his interview. You released the videos yesterday as an effort to make your department more transparent, but you look at what is clearly a lot of anger right now in the streets, and it's hard to say whether that increased trust at all with your department. Uh, yeah, I, I think it did, uh, and I think it will continue to do that. But this is a 
this is a tragic event for our entire community. So yes, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot out there that is very emotional. But I have seen some of the conversations change since we've had that video released to the facts of the case as opposed to filling in the facts because there's a void of facts. And so I think that's a positive change. Obviously, people are still very angry and we expected them to be still be angry because they still don't have all the answers and just releasing the video doesn't change that. You expected the anger. Do you understand it? Yeah, I, I do understand it. I, but again, I, I, I think at some point we have to evolve to where we have a tremendous amount of trust between law enforcement and the community. So people trust that we do a thorough investigation and we'll come to the just outcomes. And clearly we're not there right now because you see what is going on right now, but we will continue to work towards that. So it, by making the rounds to all the different media, he's clearly saying, we have nothing to hide. Can I answer all your questions? No. It's an ongoing investigation. I have to protect the integrity of the investigation, but I'm gonna respond. I'm not gonna run away from difficult questions. And we're gonna talk about the fact that we, it's our job as a police department to earn credit with our, with our community and to show them that we are, are worthy of the power bestowed upon us and that you should be able to trust us and that it's our job to make sure that um, you know what's going on at your police department and that you believe in us. And so he de-escalated his critics. He de-escalated the media that is naturally going to be very aggressive after this type of shooting. And he de-escalated a lot of the, the protesters just by being open. He couldn't answer all the questions because it was so early in the investigation, but he made himself available and that set a tone of we have absolutely nothing to hide, we're in this together, and it's our job um, to let you know what's happening at your police department and the steps that, that we are taking. So I wanna show you some other examples of how do you take this idea of transparency and openness and turn it into practical application for a police department. This is a chief that is doing a briefing before um, an operation. And in the crowd, you'll see the officers who um, will be engaged in, in the operation. You also see the community members who were complaining. These, this is their, their neighborhood. They're the ones that are upset about the problem. And you see the media. And so you have all these players coming together and the chief briefing them, setting a tone of we're all in this together. This is your community. This is your operation. This is your police department working to solve your problem. And we're sharing it with the local media. And this can be done in the, the COVID restrictions by having doing it outside and just spreading out having a smaller number of people there or just making sure that you have the distance and that people are wearing masks. And maybe you don't invite the media along, maybe that's too much and you shoot your own video and then release it to the, to the, um, to the media to be able to use it. And obviously the, the real briefing is gonna be the commander that is running the operation who's gonna do the nitty gritty briefing behind the scenes and then out front, you have the chief who is talking to the community and talking to the officers and setting the tone of just letting the community feel that they are part of the process and letting their voice uh, be heard. Here's another example out of Daytona Beach. This one is the sheriff is getting ready to uh, launch a new technology and he launches it on Facebook first. We got enough space, but uh, are you ready? You want us to count to three? One. Yes. Three, ready? One. So go ahead oh, and take along. It comes out fast. Oh, you have to come up so you can actually see the tightness if you don't mind. So uh, I, I, we like I to do two. We got enough space, but so the chief, uh, excuse me, the sheriff. Um, tried it on Facebook and then had dialogue with the community. What do you think about this technology? Do you think we should use this technology? And so it opened up a new dialogue that they had never done before with the community. You don't think about engaging your community when you're getting ready to start a uh, use a new piece of technology or a new tool. But since you're going to be using it on the community you serve, then is it reasonable to let them have a voice? And it worked for 
the sheriff in Daytona because they had a lot of positive dialogue and were able to answer questions that people had and the misinformation that people had. They were able to set the record straight and have productive dialogue about it. Another example is looking at what LA did when they were considering uh, whether or not they should release body one camera video to the public. This was back before the law was passed in 2019. And they brought in the policing project from NYU School of Law and um, did a very, very comprehensive uh, outreach to the community with community forums, with online and uh, paper surveys with, uh, that they did at the community forums. They had focus groups for the police officers. They did a very big social media push and email push, uh, sent out flyers and really got community input on whether or not the community should see body-worn camera footage. And I thought it was very interesting that both the officers and the community were in agreement. The video should be released. They were in disagreement on when it should be released, but um, we all know that a law was, was passed that, that resolved that. But this, that you don't have to get the policing project involved. You can learn from what other organizations have done and use some of these ideas of, of a survey or community doing online um, listening sessions as, as we saw other, other uh, agencies have done. That as you're getting ready to launch your SPI initiative of looking at what has been successful for other organizations. And so here's a few examples from pre-COVID which would obviously have to be altered uh, to be effective and to be safe for the community. This is a town hall in Denver. This is a, um, a, a prayer walk in Richmond, a front porch roll call in Columbia, South Carolina, and then barbecuing in Camden, New Jersey, and a city council meeting in, in Cleveland. The bottom line is, is is making sure that you're engaging your community and doing it in this the, the COVID world that we live in, that people are safe, but that they can still have a voice. And so um, starting, starting the wheels turning now of having conversations with your public information office about having a news conference, virtual or socially distanced of doing it in person, of making sure that you get the community engaged by letting them even know about it, by, by keeping them informed, and then inviting the stakeholders to your news conference. So again, that they have a voice. And But if you aren't able to do that, if they're not able to attend because of COVID or because of other issues in your community, then I would recommend having a virtual engagement with those key stakeholders right before the news conference. In Tampa, when we are getting ready to um, launch something new, we engage that same group that we brought together back in May and the mayor and the chief get on virtually and launch it to them and tell them about it right before the news conference. We've created this group uh, during the crisis and it has continued to serve the city um, moving forward with new initiatives. And so even if you can't have the key stakeholders there, you can still engage them and let them know about your new initiative or your new operation um, and do it virtually. And then just as important as your external audience is your internal audience. When I work with law enforcement agencies, I often hear from the officers that, you know, they have to hear about what's happening inside their police department from the media. It's one of their biggest complaints. And so if you're, you have a new initiative coming and it's important to have the support of your, your officers so that your initiative can be successful, then tell them about it. Tell them about it before you tell the community by either videotaping a message that goes out to the officers or sending out an email, whatever form of communication that you have in place of leveraging that and letting your internal audience know about it right before you um, hit hit send on your news conference and, and go live and, and talking to your community. And then just as important as having the news conference is setting up the visuals of making sure that you find ways that the local media can tell your story. And some of that is doing the work for them of lining up the interviews, of lining up those visuals so that they can turn that into a story that is usable 
um, that they can do it under deadline and share your story with the community. The bottom line is you may not always agree with your community. In fact, you may disagree, but just the act of listening and just the act of empathizing with them can really de-escalate your community and help build that team approach um, that you need in order to sound familiar. <laughs> I love this video because I think it really um, exemplifies the importance of listening to your community and creating that opportunity for them to have a voice. Um, we, we saw so many protests around the country um, this summer and, and for myself, looking at these protests and studying these protests, uh, and I'm not talking about the violence and the looting, but the protests, there seemed to be a commonality, which is we want to have a voice and we want to be heard and we want our police department to listen to us. And so I, I wanna share this, this clip from you from the Houston chief who joined in the march um, right after the death of George Floyd and how his empathy and his listening to his community de-escalated the protests um, and, and created that cohesive sense of, of one, that the community and the police department are one and that they've got to work together um, in order to create a, a safer community. Because obviously you need the support of the community in order to do your job, in order to, um, for, to get them to, to share information with you so you can solve crimes. And they need you so that they can feel safe and secure in their homes. And so I, I thought this example um, from the chief in Houston, um, it may not work for all agencies to be this passionate, but it shows how listening and empathizing with your community can go a long way. And what Great I love shit. about this man and this man, this man, what I love about this city yeah. is that they want people of color to be to talked about as being thugs and we're bums oh. and, and, and my people, as an immigrant, we're rapists. Hmm. We, we know what? We built this country. We ain't going nowhere. The ship has sailed. So if you've got hate in your heart for people of color, get over it. Okay? Because this city is a minority majority city. And this city is a city where blacks and whites and browns and legal and illegal all get together because we judge each other by the content of our hearts. Okay? So I am angry. I'm angry. I may not be black. But I'm God's child. Yes. And when I saw that man calling out for his mama, I thought about my mama. What I kept thinking is, he must be seeing her already in the studio. Yes, he was transitioning. Her. They're not letting yes. her come. Yes. So I'm going to tell you, we will march as a department with everybody in this community. I will march until I can't stand no more. But I will not, like, like truth said, I will not allow anyone to tear down this city. Amen. Because this is our city. We don't have to. The bottom line is if the community believes that you share the same values, that you have the same goals for the community, then they're much more likely to support you, to trust you, to text you, to tweet you, to share information with you, which ultimately improves the safety for your officers. So as you're getting ready to launch your SPI initiative, think about what will work for your community and, and you can, take a look at these examples and, and find ways to engage your community so that they do have a voice in your process and that your project, your program is a success because it has the support of your community. I want to share this quote with you. Um, it's written by, for the private sector um, by someone who has made a lot of money off of understanding what the media needs to do its job. Um, but I think it applies very much to the public sector as well. And that is, if you want people to like you, then engage in likable behavior. Don't chase the likes on Facebook just because um, you want to have a, a large following on Facebook, but engage in a way that the community sees that you're the good guys and that you really do believe in doing the right thing and taking care of your community. And instead of just telling them, hey, look at us, we went to a community meeting, look at us, we're the nice guys, we do good things, here we are smiling with the community, 
engage them. The, the algorithms on social media are written that it rewards engagement. So you want to make sure that you are engaging your community, not just telling them who you are, but showing them who you are um, and engaging in, in likable behavior. And there's, there's plenty of examples of the good things that police departments are doing around the country. And you wanna make sure that you're sharing those and, and that when it comes to your SPI initiative that you're also sharing with the community and in, engaging the community. One way that um, I work with agencies around the country and helping them share is by setting up a social media team of making sure that uh, the good things that officers are doing are out there in the public eye. This was one of my social media officers in Tampa. He had just rescued a little kitten there, a little white face and a black nose. We learned from this post that reached uh, well over 200,000 people that an officer should always, always rescue a kitten and if necessary, carry a throwdown kitten. So the bottom line is this is a time for re-strategizing, re-energizing your community engagement. And there are lots of examples out there of um, agencies that have brought their own weather to their own picnic. Um, you know, we can sit back and say, well, because of COVID, we really can't do it right now, but that's just not gonna fly. It's gone on for so long and you need that community support uh, to be effective at what you do and to be effective at launching your SPI initiative. So uh, with that, I will wrap it up. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So the first one came from retired chief Bill Taylor, and he wanted to discuss strategies to bridge the digital space with in-person um, post-COVID communications. Um, and so there was quite a bit of conversation kind of about this um, in the chat. So if we can maybe talk about that a little bit. There is a combination out there of if you're doing something in person that you can also share it digitally. I think maybe that's what the question's about. In, in Orlando, they are recruiting right now for their Hispanic Citizens Academy. They're planning to have 15 people in the room, but then they will also share it digitally and have another 15 people who are engaged uh, via, via the online. And, and pretty much today, anything that you would do in person, you can also do online. Um, and I, I think the Citizens Academy are a perfect example of that because they're, they're labor intensive, they're resource intensive, and you think, well, how could we ever do that, do that digitally? But by videotaping it and showing exactly what they would normally see, they can't have the same hands-on experience but they can see things through the eyes of a police officer. And I think anything that shows the community a sneak peek behind, behind the scenes that that builds empathy for police officers and builds a better understanding with the community of what police officers face. Um, there was uh, one agency that used to do behind the closed door and that was uh, once a month, they would take the community behind a closed door at the police department. And it would be, this is how we do our fingerprinting. This is where we process our evidence. This is where we repair our vehicles. The, anything that shows um, how, how police officers do their jobs. I mean, the number one shows on TV besides reality TV are cop shows. And so you have a primetime show sitting in your station and you can visually show that using cameras and then instead of just touching a small percentage of people who are willing to dedicate 9 10 12 weeks to going to a citizens academy you can use your the digital platform as your force multiplier and really reach a much larger audience how do you select the community participants and ensure that all the voices and vulnerable communities are represented so I think lots of times what uh, communities will do is put it out in a blanket form to, via the media. And I think that that really is not effective way to reach your most disenfranchised and disengaged community members. And you really have to do a little bit of research to figure out which uh, mediums are they listening to. Are there an, is there an African-American newspaper? Is there an African-American online news services, their African-American radio station or Hispanic, whichever your uh, community you're trying to reach. 
um, there, there are different methods of reaching the community that are not just the mainstream media. And, and it is labor intensive. It's reaching out to the managers of the apartment complexes where some of your disenfranchised community members live reaching out to the businesses and posting a flyer in those areas of the community that tend not to be involved with the police, that tend not to be pro-police, uh, reaching out to the faith-based uh, organizations and trying, not just speaking with the leaders, but trying to reach their, their constituents, their follow the, the people who are involved in the church, who live in the apartment complex, who frequent that business on the corner. Those are the people that you have to reach and just pushing it out on mainstream local media really is not going to ensure that you have the right people in the room. And then I always would save the chief for making the diff difficult phone call to some community members who are not going to come on their own. They're not going to come because they see a flyer in a convenience store in their neighborhood. But we would target people who are influencers in the community and then we would have our star power, our chief, make the phone call and say, hey, I want you in this, this community meeting. I want you to be part of it because we need your voice and we need to learn from you. We need two-way dialogue. We need you to engage. And so we would hand pick maybe a half a dozen that the chief would individually call to let them know, hey, we think your voice is important. It's labor intensive. It takes time. You've got to do the research on the front end to figure out what's a channel to reach these people. And then you just have to put the legwork into recruiting them because just pushing out a news release really is not an effective way um, to reach that audience. Um, and then as far as selecting the community participants, I would look at people who are influencers, people who others listen to. They may not hold a formal position in your community. They may not be president of your NAACP or Black Lives Matter, but they may have a very large following on social media and people, they are influencing the way people think about your organization. And so those are the type of people that you want to target to be in your community. Just like in the police department, there are those who hold rank, who have influence, and then there are those who don't hold rank, who have more influence. And bringing those people together and having a conversation with them before you release something controversial in your organization is extremely effective at getting the administration's message out. And it's just as effective in the community of identifying who those people are who don't hold positions, but who are influencers in your community and then getting them engaged um, with your police department. Do you notice that trends spanning different demographics such as age, or is it more likely the younger population that is willing to be able to engage virtually would be interested in your thoughts on this as well? Believe it or not, the senior citizens, the older community are engaged on Zoom. They are at home. They're isolated. They're alienated from the community. They're the ones that are most nervous about COVID and they have figured out Zoom. That's the way they connect with their grandchildren. That's how they connect with their family members, uh, people who are not working. So the, the working community, they're obviously on Zoom and the younger demographic is obviously on Zoom. But the older demographic is, has found their way to Zoom because, out of necessity uh, because of COVID. And so, the screen in front of you is a way to reach every demographic. It is not just a younger demographic um, as social media used to be really the way to reach your younger demographic in your community. But today, uh, online, Zoom, Teams meetings, those are the way to connect with your community no matter what, what age group we're talking about. Laura, how does your business work with police departments? I work with a lot of a lot of think tanks, PERF, major city chiefs, uh, IACP, CNA, a lot of the organizations that offer help to local agencies through uh, the COPS office, through BJA. And so um, I, I, I learn from other agencies around the country and then share uh, what I learn with, uh, with the agencies that I'm working with 
uh, I worked for very progressive chief and very progressive mayor that let me try out lots of things in Tampa. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. But I've also learned from lots of organizations around the country because um, I've had the, the privilege of working with so many different police departments. I'm wondering, Laura, can you speak to performance evaluation around community activities? How should we structure data around community outreach activities and what is success? Of course, there's always goosebumps. You can count goosebumps on whether or not your project is connecting uh, with the community. Um, the other is measuring success by setting goals that are measurable. Um, and that is requiring your public information office to push out a certain number of proactive stories on a weekly basis. Now that requires making sure that your PIO office has the bandwidth to do proactive work. If you're a one-man operation and they are um, handling all your local media and handling all your social media, then you probably need to give them some more bench strength so that they can get into a proactive role. One of the last parts of um, police departments to get into a proactive role is the public information office. We've always had this model of one or two people that answer the phone when it rings and they respond to the media inquiries. Well, that is not telling your own story. That is a, an old school mentality. And there's lots of police departments, small, medium, large, that still use that model. And so I would urge you to take a look at your PIO office and see if you need to restructure it so that they can get into a proactive role. And then I would assign them a certain number of proactive stories that you expect them to um, connect with, uh, to, to push out to your local media and social media. So setting that goal can be very effective. And then with social media, since cops love numbers, um, you don't wanna look at the numbers of just how many people are following you because most of your posts are reaching a very small percentage of those followers. The way you reach a larger number of your followers is your engagement. The number of people who share your content, who engage with it and have conversation with you and who respond to it. And so those are the numbers that you wanna follow. So you can look at your engagement numbers on your different social media platforms, and then you can set goals of how to, of where you wanna go with those numbers. And then you can come up with a game plan of how do we reach higher numbers? How do we have engaging content that we don't just push a message out there but we engage the community and ask them to interact with us. And then making sure that the PIO office has the bench strength to be able to respond to those comments. If, if you're engaging people, then you've got to make sure that you are responsive when they ask a question, when they comment, that you respond back to them. And so looking at those engagement numbers can be a barometer for success uh, with the digital platforms and then setting measurable goals for proactively pushing out material uh, to your local media, to your social media. And you can add to your disenfranchised community members that, you're all, that you are, are pushing a certain number of stories to um, the community members that are less likely to engage. So you're, you're targeting that minority media, radio, TV, online. For example, if five people show up to a barbecue, we have 30 civilians in the academy in the city of 700,000. So social media is your force amplifier. Um, if you have 700,000 people in your community and you only have 30 people coming to your citizens academy, by everything that you do in person that you share it virtually as well. And then getting the people in that citizens academy to share your content as well and getting key stakeholders in your community who maybe one person out of those 30 represents a large group and getting that group of people to share the content, putting time and energy on the front end of before the session start of who are you going to target to share your content? And then not only, not only sharing it with the individuals in the room, but getting a broader audience to share it. And so when you're deciding who to recruit, Sometimes you can recruit someone just because of the number of followers that they have on social media or the influence that they can have in your community because you don't want to reach just 30 people. All the labor and all the resources that go into a, a citizens or community academy, you want to make sure you're reaching the largest possible audience. 
Um, and so social media it can definitely be your, your uh, force multiplier. Same with the barbecue. If five people show up at a barbecue, um, of making sure that you're also um, sharing that on, on social media. Well, let me just say, Laura, that was absolutely terrific. I think you gave everybody who joined us today so much food for thought, so many ideas to take back to their department and agencies. We really appreciate you sharing this. I know you've set up um, very nicely the discussion we're going to have in a few minutes in a small group breakout on collaboration and community engagement. So thank you for getting the discussion started in, in such a um, terrific way.